some of you may not know me. I think probably you do know me because I, because I have a habit of putting myself about. Um, but for those that don't know me, I'm the transit coordinator for, for, this, uh, for this particular branch, Surrey and Southwest London. And I'm also the species champion for the, for the white letter hair streak. The white letter hair streak is one of my two favorite butterflies. I have two favorite butterflies and the white letter is one of them. Um, so what this talk will cover um, is, is really, um, is really uh, what I want to talk about is the fact that, 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 that that you know, it's it's really a case study in what a species champion act actually does. Um, how you find out about the species, how you understand it, um, and how you improve the the situation for it. Um, it will be about the white letter hair streak, of course, and it's also about elm trees because the two are inextricably linked together. Um, elm is the sole larval food plant for the for the white letter, and Without that particular habitat, you simply don't have the, the butterfly. So I'm going to talk about the progress that we've made over the last few years um, and talk about the conclusions, what we've learned, and also what, what are the current threats for the species. So um, this is the map of this is the map of, of white letter hair streak records that we had back in 2015, which is when we started to do the, the regional action plan. Um, and what it reveals, what we knew about it then is, is actually surprisingly little. Um, we knew that it was in a number of, of locations in London. So we knew that it was at Battersea Park, which is here. We knew it was at Barnes Common. We knew it was at Hamlands. We knew it was at Putney Hill. We knew it was on the South London Common, so that's Wandsworth Common, uh, Tooting and Streatham Common. Uh, we knew there was a little colony around Mitcham, and we knew that there was a little colony around Epsom and Yule, and also there were sightings around, uh, around Guildford here. But really, really, we didn't, have, we didn't have a sort of a comprehensive view across it, across the, across the branch area. And what we have is this kind of smattering of smattering of other sightings and records, um, very very patchy records. So it was really difficult to say whether the whether the butterfly is actually rare, or is it or is it common. Um, a lot of the sightings are, are things which have actually been found by chance. Um, so they're divorced from the from the elm habitat. Um, we also had the botanist records for elms, so we've had, so you can see around Caterham here, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of elm recorded there, but what that simply means is that, is that someone's actually looked there, it doesn't mean to say that it's not in these other places. So when we came to do the research action plan, sorry, the regional action plan, which, which was um, in 2015. Um, this was what we came up with for the, for the white letter. Um, we made it a high priority species. So that's not quite the highest level, which is the highest priority, but that's the level down. So, the, so it's a high priority species for our area. Um, and the reason for that is because it's BAP priority species and it's a red list endangered species classified as endangered. Um, rare within VC17 and with a declining distribution, nationally endangered with extinction and dependent upon elms. So the general actions were to, to, um, to encourage uh, the growth of elm trees and the monitoring, we thought at the time this was a committee decision, was a time count of adults around reading elm trees. And the how, how is this going to be done? Well, by appointing a species champion. And um, as it sounded like a challenge and I didn't have anything else to do at the time, and there were various sites near me, um, I sort of thought, well, I'll put my name forward for this. So I did. Um, and it's sort of borne out by the, by, the, by the BC maps. The decline of the species is really, Borne out by the 
by the um, the BC maps which have appeared in various uh, quinquennial reports. So you'll see that 1995 to 99 there were quite a, there's a lot of uh, a lot a, a lot of sightings. There's a lot of red dots there. There's far fewer red dots in um, 2005 to 2009. Um, the statistic which you normally see on the BC website is that between 1976 and 2016, there was a 96% decline in the species, which, which if true, would make it the largest decline of any butterfly species. And the reasons for that are of course not hard to, not hard to find. Um, it's due to the, the loss of habitat because of the ravages of Dutch elm disease, which happened in the 1970s and the 1980s. A huge, huge loss of habitat, and it completely decimated the poor white letter hair streak. So when you start doing this, you have to really think your way in. Um, uh, think your way into the subject and and see what other research there is. And what I hit upon and what I found incredibly useful was this uh, website and, and project by uh, Andrew Middleton and Liz Goodyear from Harps and Middlesex. Um, and they run a they run a, a, a white letter hair uh, a white letter hair street project um, for a number of years um, and produced a report. And the key points of this, or the things, the things which I really took on board, were this misconception that people had that all elm is dead. Um, in fact, there's an awful lot of, of elm around. It's just that you have to look for it and you have to be able to ID it. And the best time to do that is in the spring when the elm stands out in the treescape. Um, when this is when this is when the trees are in fruit. I'll show you some pictures of this in a minute um, and and it really stands out and it's easy to actually see. Whereas that sort of visual visual identity is lost later on in the year. Um, and then you have to note the locations to look at during the flight period. And you also have to be aware that elm is a species. It's one of the most confusing tree species um, there is. Um, there's probably only about three or four people in the country that actually understand it. Um, and, and it. And it's confusing because elm hybridizes very readily. Um, so you get many, many uh, varieties of it, uh, particularly regional varieties, and they're called by a, a, a multitude of different names. But for our purposes, it actually doesn't matter that much because, because we're basically looking for any elm. The other thing that you have to do is to search proactively. This is really, really important point. Um, the, the white letter hair streak, as per other of the canopy species like the purple emperor or, or the, um, the purple hair streak, are not going to flutter down in front of you. You have to go and find them yourself. So it's a completely different method of searching to to, to people who are you know, used, for example, to walking transects, where you're walking a line and you, and you note down what you see on either side of you. You have to actually go and seek these things out yourself. And in Hearts and Middlesex, um, the conclusion of the report was almost all elm holds a colony. So that was a really encouraging message. And it begged the possibility that, that that there is a lot more white letter hair streak and an elm uh, in VC 17, Surrey and Southwest London, but it, but it was being overlooked. Right, so I just really want to say something about the, about the white letter itself. Um, this is uh, so-called because of the, the, the W on the underside of the wing. Um, this is in fact, you will very, very rarely see um, the white letter up that close. What you do see is this. This is a photograph I took uh, many years ago um, back in uh, Nonsuch Park, I think it was. And you see little isosceles, dark little isosceles triangles at the top of the elm, ca the, the, the elm camp canopy. And you see them flying around the top of the canopy. They have this jinking, jittering flight which is very characteristic of, uh, characteristic of the hair streaks. Uh, they nectar up there on aphid honeydew. 
and if to and to see them you have to you have to you have to go at the right time exactly the right time and really and really look in the right place um, in our area they start to they start to emerge about uh, the 15th of june um, that's really in surrey in in london um, they tend to emerge earlier maybe the 10th and I, and I think on tooting common in 2020 i think they were even earlier than that um, and the flight period in our area is goes from about 15th of june through to the end of july and really by the end of july they're more or less finished um, the field guides tend and to say different the field guides will tell you that there are basically a butterfly of july and early august but that's really not true in our in our in our area and then to find it what you really need to do is you really need um, to be able to view the elm canopy at the sky so this is this is what we have here um, and 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 it's very very difficult to see the butterflies you know if they're against a dark background so a canopy view is really really important they tend to fly on the sunny and the, sh and the sheltered sides of the of the trees they will fly to adjacent trees so they particularly like ash trees and they like um, lime trees as well and anything which is sort of small and triangular and dark is likely to be a white letter hair streak there, there is the possible confusion species with the with the purple hair streak, but the purple hair streak tends to fly around the oak trees, which is, uh, you know, which is that, which is their habitat, um, and they tend to sort of have this slightly sort of silver, silvery appearance, um, and they also don't, um, they don't spiral. So the clincher when you're IDing um, a white letter hair streak is that you'll see you'll see a couple of uh, at least i'm assuming males you'll see a couple of males going to go into this sort of very very sharp spiral upwards they'll fly straight upwards and then they will and then they'll sort of divert across to one side so when you see a spiral that's that's the clincher you know that you definitely do have white letter hair streaks this is what you see much less frequently um, this is uh, a couple of white letter hair streaks have come down to nectar on um, on bramble in this case. So you only tend to see this when honeydew is in short supply in the canopy, and you tend to see it as well towards the end of the flight period. And they may well fly some distance from their elm trees um, uh, in in order to do this. So these ground sightings, it's not a particularly reliable way of, of, um, of monitoring the butterfly. Um, so this is, the, this is the egg, the ovum, um, and you can see it's got this sort of appearance of a, it's got this flying saucer appearance, this white ring around the outside and the sort of the dark center. Um, it's much harder to find than, than brown hair streak eggs. I assume some of you are used to looking for brown hair streak eggs, but it's okay. You can, you can find it on witch elm if you look hard enough. And this particular one, this is in the, the classic position. Um, they, they lay in a number of places, but the classic one is the girdle scar. So this, this here is the girdle scar. This is the old growth, and this is last year's growth. And, they tend on the underside of the scar between between the two. Um, and this is the larvae. And what the, the larva is, is, is probably hatching out quite soon. It will probably hatch out in April. It goes straight into the bunches of the seeds. Um, and thereafter, it feeds on the it feeds on the elm leaves. Um, some people I've met think it's possible to identify white letter hair streak larvae using uh, feeding damage but um, I, I never do this myself because there's a lot of other things which can be feeding on, on elm. So what I did, what I started doing um, really following the lead of Liz and Andrew 
was listing a significant elm habitat. So not that's not every single piece of suckering elm because that would that would just be impossible. But where we've got significant trees or significant stands of trees, and wherever possible, what I've tried to do is I've tried to ground truth this. So to go and actually look at it myself to take the grid reference and confirm that it's there. Um, so what we did, what we did was uh, initially to look at the sites where, where there were existing white letter hair streak records. Um, so really to go for the to go for the lowest hanging fruit. And then also what uh, what I subsequently did was I looked at the the botanist records. So there's quite substantial Surrey bot botanical records for which elm particularly. I did freedom of information request to councils, which was particularly useful um, in London, uh, where they the, where they where they're very good at recording their trees, uh, much less good in Surrey where they where they're not. And also in London, there's this very good London tree map, which I also used. Um, what I found, however, was that all of these, all of the above, were the records tended to be very old, and they were also highly inaccurate. Um, certainly, their certainly their ID skills left something to be desired. Um, and then I also got a lot of tip-offs from people with local knowledge. Um, so a number of people alerted me to to you know to where there were trees. Um, every time I every time I went out, um, I tried to speak to rangers and ask them if they if they if they knew of any elms on their particular reserves. And I also spoke to a number of guerrilla gardeners, um, of whom there there are a surprising number around, and got some good information from them. But most of all, most of all, what I found what I found best was actually spotting them from the car. And then and then and then noting down where they were, and then foot slogging around. And invariably, what I found is that where you see one from the car, you will find you will find others. So, those of you that have had the misfortune to uh, to travel in the passenger seat of my car will know that I'm always pointing out elms to you, um, whether you like it or not. So it's really important, obviously, to be able to um, to identify elm. Um, and there's a number of things which you need to be aware of. Um, the leaves, I suppose, are the, th the first thing which you always look at. So these are um, these are which elm leaves. The leaves, uh, elm leaves are alternate. You can see these are alternate. Um, and they're, they're highly toothed. Um, but the most uh, the standout feature is that they have these asymmetrical leaf bases here. See, there's leaf base asymmetry, and and that's the thing which really IDs elm for you. Um, the bark, uh, this particular one, this is this witch elm, and the witch elm leaf is is really like sandpaper. If you rub it on your your face, you'll find it's really really rough. Um, but there's also a thing called smooth-leaved elm as well, just to complicate matters. And the bark, the, the, if you look at the trunk, the bark is always very, very fissured, but particularly as, it, as, as, as the tree gets older. This again, this is a, this is a, um, a, a, a witch elm trunk. Um, uh, and these are the flowers. Um, so, Elm, elm has, has red flower with the exception of, of one of the species. It's always one of the first trees to flower during the year. Um, so uh, the, the, the trees have been in flower in February and March. And then they, at the moment, they're just on the cusp to, to changing over to the seeds. So, so elms have these flats here with the seed in the middle. And these are known as Samaras and they produce big bunches of them and they have this lime green appearance which is what makes them stand out and then it's also just the way that the tree looks so this is the this is a tree this is a planted elm obviously um, and this is in the middle of the a24 
uh, by Dorking Deep Ding Station. And you can see that the, if you look at the foliage, it's just the way that the foliage tends to spread out. Um, it's the way the foliage tends to spread out and it couldn't really be anything other than an elm. So that's very, very easy to spot from the car as indeed, as indeed I did um, as I drove past it. Right, so this is the, this is my database. And I've been, I've been uh, working on this database now for six years. Um, and it's got about 1100 entries and I'm adding to it all the time. Um, so what I've got is I, I organize everything by, by council, uh, by council area, because, um, because that, seemed to be the, that seemed to be the most meaningful way to do it. Um, anything in black is something which I've, um, I've been and looked at myself and I've ground truthed and it will have a 10, a 10 digit grid reference. Anything which is in red is something which I haven't ground truthed yet, but I've been, I've been, I've been told about or tipped off about. Um, so I also, I also make various notes, um, you know, the location, uh, can you see the canopy? Um, how big is the tree and anything else which might be which might be relevant and then also I've got the I've, uh, here the ticks the, these are the tr these are the trees where we've actually found white letter hair streak on so this is my database I'm very proud of it um, and as I said I'm adding to it pretty much all the time so I just really want to to talk about um, just really want to talk about some of the varieties of elm which can be found. Um, so this is uh, th this is English elm. Um, this is not in fact a, a, a native tree. English elm, Ulmus pracera. It's not in fact a native tree, but it was probably brought to was probably brought to to Britain by the by the Romans. Um, and it was it was it was planted extensively as a hedgerow tree, and it doesn't really produce viable seed, but it suckers up. So the fact that it suckers means that they're all clones, and the fact that they're clones means that it's particularly vulnerable to Dutch elm disease. So this is what you used to see a lot of in in uh, in the countryside. This is a mature English elm. This is the this is what's always associated with the landscapes of Constable, and you know the, the cooing of doves in immemorial elms, and unfortunately we don't see this we don't see this anymore. What you do see um, is this, which is which is elm which gets to about this height, um, and then it will the, the disease will get into it, and and it will and it will die back to the rootstock. So this is a this is a stand on uh, that I photographed on Mitcham Common, um, and you can see just here you can see some of the bare the bare branch just here. This is Dutch elm disease beginning to beginning to get in, unfortunately. Um, this is a witch elm, almost Labra, and this is our this is our native elm. This is an uh, this is a tree uh, which I photographed in Dulwich Park. And you can see it's it's in fruit. Um, there's the lime green appearance. Um, it's it, it it's an it, it's an elm, um, but its it, its occurrence is is kind of patchy across our area. So there are some places like uh, like Caterham or Godalming where there are the, there are lots of trees, and there are other areas where there are there are very few or none. So it's really got this sort of patchy distribution across that area. Um, the witch elm does produce viable seed. Um, and it, so therefore it has more genetic variability than the English elm. Um, it's still susceptible to Dutch elm disease, but it does have more resistance than the poor old English elm. So it's, you still do get some quite big trees and, you know, as per this one, which is probably about 30 feet high. This is another tree which is rare in our area. Uh, this is the European white elm. Um, 
Ken and Gillian will recognise this. This is um, this is a tree which is on Shalford Common uh, to the south of Guildford. This is also known as fluttering elm because it has seeds on stalks. It's rare across our area and it, it may or may not be, be native. Um, uh, it's certainly native to Europe, but we're not really sure the, 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 the jury is out really as to whether it's as, as to whether it is a British native tree or not. But it does have this one really interesting feature, which is that it has a chemical in the bark which repels the, the beetles which spread Dutch elm disease. And so for that reason, although, although it is susceptible to Dutch elm disease, it very, very rarely goes down with it. So you see, we've got a big, big stand here. This is um, one, this is the first of the of the of the disease resistant elms. This is a uh, Sapporo Autumn Gold. And this is a standard tree of planted trees, which is in the middle of North Holmwood Roundabout uh, to the south of Dorking. And this was very much the first uh, cultivar which was which was planted. There were firms such as Pitney Bowes, which made it available to councils in the 1980s. And so there's lots of stands uh, um, planted around our area, particularly up in London. Um, and um, it's, it's a cross between the Siberian elm and the Japanese elm, um, but it's, it, the white letters are perfectly happy about using it. Um, I don't think I've ever not found it, not found the white letters on a, on a stand of trees. Um, you'll, you'll note that, um, that it has, that it's also inherited the faults of elm trees um, in that they, the, the, the lower branches tend to drop off. So some of you may have been Boy Scouts or Girl Guides and may remember that, that you were always told, you know, don't pitch your tent under an elm tree. So that's the, that's the reason why. <clears throat> and then subsequently a lot of, a lot more a lot more cultivars uh, disease resistant cultivars have been developed this is new horizon in peckham rye park um, and uh, it, again this is a cross between the siberian and the japanese elm um, and it's really been developed as a street tree or a park tree um, and the white letters are perfectly happy to use it, but you'll see that they don't really look like the other elms do. It's a much more sort of cultivated, um, cultivated fastidiate tree. Right, so I just really want to say, um, I, I, I put this slide in thanks and acknowledgements because, because um, all of the work that we've done um, it's very much a group effort. I, there's no way that I could possibly do this on my own. Um, and what I've tended to, done, to do is to, is to pass information out to other people who've done a lot of the searching. And then really I've been the collator of the data that we collect. Um, I did a training session uh, back in June 2016 um, at uh, Horton Country Park. 30 people came, which I was amazed uh, by. And um, and what I didn't let on at the time is that I'd never is that I hadn't at that point actually seen the butterfly, so I've never done a training session where I actually knew so little about the subject and had to really fly by the seat of the pants. Anyway, I particularly like to say thank you to to these people here. These are my these are my these are my um, my principal searchers. Um, um, so if you're on that list, thank you very, very much. I couldn't, I couldn't do without you. But there are, but there are others as well. Other, other people have given me a lot of information. Um, and I'd also like to thank as well a couple of other people, which um, Andrew Brooks particularly, who runs the, who runs the trial, the trial ground at Great Fontley. Um, and Andrew supplied me with seed. And um, and it, 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 I, I'm always sort of uh, sharing information with him via email. We've been really, really useful. And then the people I've worked with in the councils, so that's Craig at, at Richmond, Elliot at Kingston, Dawn and Dave at London Borough of Sutton, 
and Ian at Lambeth. And I believe that you're on the call, Ian. So thank you very much for your support. Okay, so I found, uh, the first time I found White Letter Hair Streak was 1st of July 2016, I remember very, very well. Um, and as soon as we started looking, um, as soon as we started looking, we, we, we were able to, we were able to sort of say that, yes, we, we found them. Um, so pretty much wherever we, wherever we looked, the trees that we'd identified, um, they had, they had white letter on them. So that was, that was really exciting. And you just gave you the, gave you the feeling of sort of forward progress. The key to it was basically doing your homework. You had to do the homework of, of the foot slog um, earlier in the year to find out where the good trees were that you were going to go back and look at during the flight period. That was absolutely essential. And then the other thing was to, to persevere um, in your searching. You had to look long enough and hard enough because the butterflies don't always fly. Um, you might, you, I mean, I've waited three hours under a tree before, before actually finding them. So you, you really need to develop some perseverance. Um, on the other hand, sometimes, sometimes everything goes swimmingly and you see them in 30 seconds and they put on a great show for you. But that's, that's, you can't always rely on that. So what I did was I, I um, very, very quickly, I just started to look for presents. I gave up looking for abundance. I, I, I don't think there's any way that you can gauge the abundance the uh, the abundance of the of the white letters um, um, there may very very well be a lot more butterflies sitting at the top of the trees i don't know but i just simply went looking for presents and i gave up very quickly any notion of doing timed counts as well um, i i think it's a very it, it's a very mobile species um, uh, wherever there is ha habitat, even quite isolated habitat, the white letter has found it. So my assumption is that it is able to disperse quite readily. Um, and it's very much a city butterfly as opposed uh, uh, as much as a, a, a country butterfly. There's very, very good habitat on London commons right. or in London streets and particularly by the side of main roads. And one of the best places that you can actually look for it in London is actually along the South Circular Road. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about the sightings. Um, this was 2015. These were the these were the sightings we, we um, these were the sightings we came across um, in the first year, and this is very much the these are very much the locations that I've read out earlier on. So we've got the we've got the Thames at Barnes, London Wetland Centre. Um, Battersea Park, um, Hamlands, Epsom and Yule, the, uh, that's Putney Heath, Wimbledon Common, um, that's Mitcham, and this is the, uh, this is the Dorking area. Um, so really, really we went for the lowest hanging fruit. And then by 2018, I won't go through all of these locations, but by 2018 we got a lot more locations in London, and uh, well, in inner London, but also in outer London as well, a lot more locations. Um, and then we sort of tracked it as well to areas like Esher, um, we, uh, uh, around the Guildford area, um, between Guildford and, and Dorking, and then Rygate and also Coulston and Caterham. So we were really sort of spreading out. And then, and then for 2019, I was determined that we were going to look in these other places, sort of particularly to the south and the west, um, where we hadn't yet found it. Okay. So this is the this is the up to date map. This is the this is state of the art. I'm afraid you'll notice that the mapping has changed. <laughs> the mapping, uh, the mapping has gone through a number of changes. We're hoping to do something about that quite soon. But this is the latest, the latest map, and this is all these these dots 
are associated with elm habitat. All of the, the chance site has been, taking it, been taken out of this. So um, the places that we've, uh, the new places that we found in 2019, uh, found it um, in Sanderstead here, at New Addington. Um, we found it at uh, Old Coolston here. This is, um, this is Limpsfield. Um, this is, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that is field. Um, this is Lingfield, the Lingfield, the nature reserve. Um, I'm sure Richard Stevens will be very pleased about that. This is Outwood, the National Trust um, area at, at Outwood, which has the most amazing trees, the biggest trees which are found in, in, in Surrey. Um, sites around, um, two sites around Gatwick Airport. And thank you very much, Rachel, who I see is on the call today. Thank you very much for in, in, in getting those sightings. Um, the, this is um, uh, Leith Hill Place. Uh, this is Orford Crossways and where we so we found it there. We found it at Grafham and we found it at Bramley. And then also um, at, uh, at Godalming, just here. Um, and at Hindhead and, and, and Farnham, and we also had a sighting at, at Egham just here. Okay, so something else which we can do, um, something else which you can do as a species champion is that you can work with, with other groups and with, with other people. Um, so um, I worked with. Um, I worked with Richmond Borough Council. Um, so I worked with Richmond Borough Council, uh, who were rewriting their uh, who were rewriting their uh, biodiversity action plan. So I did a species action plan for the white letter hair streak and and elms. So it's particularly good because it raises the profile, um, and it also puts um, planting elms. Uh, into the into their management plan, which can only be a good thing. So this is me with Craig Ruddick, who's the, or I think who was, I think he's left now, who's the arboricultural of the arboricultural uh, officer for, for Richmond Pond Thames. This is the South Circular Road in the background, and this is a this is a Huntington Elm where we're we're pictured against here. You'll note the you'll note the very fissured bark. Um, and then something else, which is so from there, it's a very small step to actually um, it's a very small step to actually germinating your own trees. So this is a this is an elm tree um, about a about a week old. Um, so something which I which we germinated. Pamela and I went round um, a number of sites uh, collecting seed, and um, and. After a few, after a bit of trial and error, we succeeded in germinating quite a lot of trees, um, and they've been doing quite well. And we've gradually been planting them out, and it's a really wonderful thing. To, it's a gr really great uh, feeling to, to germinate your own. So this is one of the this is one of the trees which um, which we planted. This is one of the ones I germinated, and this is a European white elm which has gone in at Berrylands Nature Reserve in Kingston. Um, so I've got still got quite a few of these trees. So if anyone is, is interested, um, uh, I'll, I'll show you my, uh, my, my email address at the end. You can drop me an email and we'll see if we can supply one for you. So in conclusion, I'm just going to I, I'm just going to draw just going to say a few things in conclusion. Um, I think that White Letter Hair Streak is doing well in 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 in, in VC17. I don't think it's threatened. Um, I think it's a highly resilient species. I think it's a I think it's an admirable little critch, little critter. Um, it just seems to be able to survive anything which which nature and human beings throw at it, and it's probably everywhere in our area. But, but thinly distributed. I think, I think you can actually monitor it by tree. 
So I think if you've got good, good elm habitat, if you find good elm habitat, you can just assume that white letter hair streak is going to be there. And what I will continue to do is I'll continue to monitor, but, it's, but, but really at a lower level, because at the moment we've got some other priority species which need our attention. I'm going to continue to add to the tree database and I'm going to continue to plant and promote new trees. So all that is very, very positive, but um, I just really want to uh, want to hone in on a couple of threats. Um, this last year, um, or the last couple of years anyway, we've really been aware of the of the problems um, emanating from ash dieback, um, and and really it just underlines the, the sort of the constant threat of new diseases um, to, to our native trees um, due to climate change and, and also due to our particularly lax biosecurity. Um, and then also this is the this is the work of the the handiwork of the elm zigzag sawfly, the so-called sorrow bug. Um, my heart really sank when I heard that this had been found in Surrey um, because it's prevalent in areas in Europe and it's really denuded the elm trees and, and as a result has weakened them. Um, and I have, found, I have found the feeding damage of this, of this, of this, new, um, this new pest, but so far it really hasn't, um, it hasn't denuded trees. Uh, and, 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 and it may not behave in, that, in the way that it does in parts of Europe in this country, but, um, but it, is, it is a worry and it is a concern. And, and of course, you know, you're always aware of the pressure we put on our trees by, by human activity. So that really concludes, that concludes my talk. That concludes my talk. Uh,